Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to talk about controllability. Now this word seems to mean different things to different people. I tried to look it up online and I found a definition that said controllability is the ability of a system to be controlled or managed. That definition seemed to make sense to me and at the same time it seemed a little bit circular. <laughs> A definition that seems to work well for us as controls engineers and something you'll commonly see is that a system is said to be controllable if there exists a control or sequence of controls that can take a system from an arbitrary initial state to some arbitrary final state in finite amount of time. Now we're going to see later that that definition has something to do with the dynamics of the system as well as the types and number of inputs to that same system. Now we're going to investigate how to test for this mathematically later but you know me, I always like to start off with real world examples and you also know that I also like dogs. So let's see if we can combine the two like Voltron and set the stage for controllability. Okay, so let's talk about controllability of a real life system. So in this case, I've got, uh, guess, come here. I've got this dog here. So let's see if I can transition this system states from a certain initial condition to another arbitrary initial condition using different types of input. So the first control input, maybe let's just try just pure voice. Maybe we'll see how well he responds to just voice. Gussie down, up. He's not doing anything here, right? So you can see he's not very controllable with this input. But what if I have two inputs, maybe a combination of voice and uh, visual motion, maybe the system would be more controllable in that case. Okay, you guys see, down, good boy. Okay, up, you guys see, up, and okay, he's a little more controllable, right? You can see, so up, you guys see, stand up on two legs, stand up. No, see, I can do some state transitions, but not all of them. So he's a little bit more controllable. Now, what if I have a third kind of input? So how about uh, how about steak? We'll see. We'll see how well he responds to a steak input. Now you can see. Oh, see, and look at this. He does it right away. So the system is highly controllable using just this one input. I don't even need to do voice or uh, hand motions in this case. Just the steak is enough to get him to do what I want. See, look at that. I can make him dance with just this one input. So the system, I can make him do anything with this one input. He is, he is fully controllable with this input of stake. So well, this is hopefully illustrating how a system can be different levels of controllable depending on what the, ow, ow. Okay, Gussie. He can be controllable do, uh, depending on the different types of control inputs you choose to excite the system with. All right, we saw how you can roughly apply the idea of controllability to a dog. I've gone ahead and rewritten our mathematical definition of controllability up here on the board. And I wanted to point out that while this definition seems to make sense and is applicable to pretty much any system uh, that we're interested in controlling, it's not terribly helpful because it actually doesn't tell you how to find this control U that will take you from your arbitrary initial state to your arbitrary final state. So one thing you could do is you could try to brute force this. You could try to find yourself a control U, but then you need to go from an arbitrary initial state to an arbitrary final state. That seems like a very difficult search problem. There's infinite number of searches you probably have to do. So this definition, while useful, is not terribly practical. Where it becomes practical is if you have a linear system, there's a very easy test to see if this is true or not. So let's just write down here that if your system is linear. In other words, if you have an x dot of t is equal to an a x of t plus b u of t, right? What you can do is you can build what's called the controllability matrix. And the way you build this is very interesting. Let's call this controllability, controllability matrix PC, okay? So the way you do this is the first set of columns is you just take the B matrix and you stick it right here. The next set of columns is A times B. The next one is A squared B, A cubed B, all the way up to A n minus one B, right? So you see that this controllability matrix is a kind of fat matrix in the sense that there are n states, right? So A here is obviously n by n. B is n by m here. So here n is going to be your number of states, right? And m is going to be your number of controls. 
or inputs. So you see what we end up with here is each one of these entries here is basically an n by m, right? That's n by m, that's n by m, that's n by m. So you do this um, n times. So overall, what we end up with here is this overall PC matrix is going to basically end up to be a n by n times m matrix. All right, so again, you're gonna see that it's, it's, it's fat. Right now, once you build this PC matrix here, it's very simple to test if this linear system is controllable or not. And the condition is actually really simple. So the system is controllable if and only if basically the rank of this matrix PC is equal to N, the number of states. So let's box this up because this is our test for controllability and it's very convenient. So again, just to refresh everyone's memory, remember what rank is? Rank of a matrix A is basically the number of linearly independent rows or columns. Right, uh, rows and columns doesn't make uh, doesn't matter here because the um, the row space and the column space, the dimensions are the same from our fundamental theorem of uh, linear algebra. So all you need to do here is compute this P rank this matrix P C and then check how many linearly independent rows or columns there are. And nice thing that I'll maybe plug right now is MATLAB actually has a function literally called rank that will help you compute. Uh, the rank of it. And there's also another function in MATLAB called CTRB that will basically do this operation. So maybe I'll just plug in MATLAB. This is a CTRB function. And this rank in MATLAB is literally rank. <laughs> so there's two functions that should help you. Let's go through an example of this uh, to compute PC just so we're all on the same page. So give me a second, I'll erase the board and we'll jump over to an example. Okay, so throughout the series of this discussion today, we're actually gonna look at a bunch of different examples. So why don't we label these to start? So we're gonna start with example one. This is a, gonna be a controllable system. Okay, so let's say that you've got dynamics that look like x dot is equal to your A matrix because it's gonna be a zero, three, two, four, x plus, you just have one input to the system, minus two and one times u. Okay, so here's your A matrix, here's your B matrix, okay? So to test if this system is controllable, what I wanna do is just go ahead and compute the controllability matrix. So in this case, it's just gonna be B and then A times B and I stop here, okay? Because N is only two here, so N minus one is just A. So all we gotta do is build this matrix. So this is really simple. Okay, B, I just need to put this entry in here, minus two, one. Uh, A times B, you can do this matrix math here of uh, multiplying A times B, do that in math, MATLAB, Mathematica, whatever you're interested in. And I think what you'll end up with here is uh, three and zero. Okay, so here's my PC matrix. Now we could go over and check the number of linearly independent rows or columns using the rank function in MATLAB or Mathematica. Um, but really, it's uh, this is pretty trivial. You can clearly see that this column here is not pointed in the same direction as that column. They, they are linearly independent of each other. So we see here that the rank of PC is equal to two, which is equal to N, which is the number of states. So system is controllable. So basically, system is controllable. And right, it was an if and only if, so this is kind of a two-way implication. All right. Okay, great. So uh, this is interesting. One thing that we'll maybe note here is uh, if you think about this, this is also fun to think about because there's only one control input to this system, right? So here's your system. And you, it's really, I don't need to put a bar on this. There's really just a U1. There's one input. There's like just a gas pedal or something like that. But this system actually has two states. It has an X1 and an X2. Now, the implication of controllable here means that 
we can take this system from any initial condition to any final condition. So for example, X1 and X2 could both be at the origin and now I want X1 to be at 50 and I want X2 to be at negative 75. It's interesting here because what this tells us is that using one control, you can actually control two states. So this concept isn't as crazy as you might think. For example, consider a system that you're familiar with like your car. So a simple model of this car might have four states, say the position east, the position north, the velocity, and the heading angle. And the control inputs, well, we've only got two of them in this situation, namely the gas pedal position and the steering wheel angle. So to check for controllability, we ask if we can start from an arbitrary initial condition, say at this end of the parking lot, and then find a set of control inputs that transition the state to an arbitrary final state, say the other end of the parking lot with a velocity of 20 miles an hour and a heading angle that's needed to hit this bear right in the face. Yeah, so we see that despite only having two control inputs, we can control all four states of the car, so this system is fully controllable. <laughs> Whoops, <good thing. laughs> okay, so let's look at example two. How about this time, let's look at a system that's uncontrollable. Okay, so the system I want to look at is our good old friend, the mass spring damper, but put this in two dimensions. So there's a mass here, there's a spring here, and a spring here. Okay, so let's say, call the horizontal spring K1 and the core, vertical spring K2, okay? And what I want to do here is I'm gonna measure the horizontal position and the, hor the vertical position like such, okay? And now what I'm gonna do here is I'm only gonna apply a single control to this system in the horizontal direction. We'll draw this in green. Let's call this FH. That's a positive control input of FH of T, okay? So with this system, I think it's pretty trivial to go ahead and choose a state vector. Let's go ahead and choose a state vector that is the um, horizontal position, the horizontal velocity, the vertical position, and the vertical velocity. Okay, so here's my four states. And in this case, the control vector is just going to be this FH of T, okay? So what we can do here is you can go ahead and write your equations of motion, right? Which is basically Newton's second law. Okay, so uh, I think everyone's got pretty good practice uh, with that. So I'm gonna skip a couple of steps and basically say that you can get this to look like X dot is going to be, well, what's X1 dot? It's H2, okay, so this is basically going to be X2. All right, and then here's all the dynamics, which is basically uh, some of the forces in the horizontal direction, right? So this is going to be, you're going to get your 1 over M times F horizontal of T minus K1 over M X1 of T. Then you're going to get X4 of T down here, and then you'll get minus K2 over X3 of T, okay? So this is basically Newton's second law written down in vector format after we did all the summing of all the moments or some summing of all of the forces and all that kind of good stuff. So you get these dynamics. Let's go ahead and write these in linear format. So I'm going to write this as x1, x2, x3, x4 plus some other matrix uh, U1 of T, right? Which was this FH. Maybe, maybe I should have written this as U1. It's probably, a, yeah, well, why don't we do this? Sorry, U1. It's probably a better way to refer to that. Okay, so we see, uh, all right, this is gonna be a four by four. So let me go ahead and kind of sketch it out first. And this is gonna be a four by one, okay? So uh, if we do this, I think you're gonna get a one zero zero zero, and then you'll get uh, minus K one over M zero zero zero, and then you're gonna get zero 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 one, and then a zero zero minus K two over M zero, and then this is gonna be a zero one over M zero zero, okay? So great, so here's your A matrix, here's your B matrix, right? Okay, so 
here's our linear system. Why don't we go ahead and now compute the controllability matrix? So to do that, we are going to use our good old formula that the controllability matrix PC is going to be B, A, B, A squared, B, A cubed, B. Okay. And maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, right? But hopefully we all understand that this power, this is matrix multiplication, not element wise power, right? So this is matrix multiply, multiply, right? So in other words, this is A, 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 right? This is not a dot hat cubed, right? If you're using uh, MATLAB, this is element wise, right? That is not what you want to do here. You want to do full on proper matrix multiplication with all these operations. Okay, so uh, okay, so if you go ahead and do that, the PC matrix that you're going to end up with is I'll save you the uh, algebraic manipulation, but you will still end up with a four by four. Okay, and this is going to look like 0, 1 over m, 0 minus k1 over m squared, uh, 1 over m, 0 minus k1 over m squared, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay? So just looking at this, I think it's easier to maybe think about the, uh, the, the, the number of linearly independent rows here. You can clearly see that this is a vector. This vector is linearly independent of this vector, but then there's a whole bunch of zeros here. So we can easily see right off the bat here that rank of PC is only equal to two, which is less than N of four, right? Gosh, this was sorry. I, this is this is ugly. You get the point, right? <laughs> the rank of the controllability matrix is less than the number of of states here, so system is not controllable. Okay, and again, hopefully this makes good physical intui uh, intuitive sense here because this system, the way it's set up. There's no way that with this control input, are you ever going to be able to influence the vertical dynamics of the system? All you can hope to do is influence the horizontal dynamics of the system, but you're never going to be able to perturb it. So you're never going to be able to move the vertical uh, states to some arbitrary location. So this clearly reflects it that the system is, is not controllable. Okay, so let's go on to actually example three. So let me erase this. I left most of this up because we're going to do a small variation on this. So let's see if we can take this uncontrollable system and turn it controllable. Okay, so what I mean by that is what happens if we add a second control input to this system? So instead of just having a horizontal force being applied, let's say we add another uh, thruster or jet to this system or some control actuator that can apply a vertical force. So let's call this plus FV of T, okay? So the state vector is the same that we had earlier, but the control vector now changes. So now the control vector, there's actually two separate inputs, right? So the first input is gonna be our original FH of T, and now the second control input is gonna be this vertical force that you can actuate independently of the, of the horizontal force, okay? So what are the ramifications of this? So again, here's the equations of motion for the original system. So all we gotta do is slightly modify this for um, the new system. So I think the only thing that would change now is that down here you would get a plus one over m u two of t, right? Because now this vertical force can influence this bottom uh, set of dynamics, the vertical dynamics. So what that does is your B matrix is gonna change so now, I gotta scoot this over. So now it's going to be a four by two matrix because I need to pull out U1 and U2. Okay, so the B matrix now looks like zero and then we get the one over M picked up down here. Okay, so here's your B matrix, okay? All right, so let's do the same thing. Let's come back over here to compute our controllability matrix, PC, and it's the exact same expression, right? So PC is gonna be B, A, B, A squared, B, A cubed, B, right? 
And if you do that calculation, um, this is what you're going to end up with. So remember, we said it's going to be kind of a, it's, in this case, it's going to be a fat matrix. It's going to be a four row by eight column. So this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So uh, the first column is just going to be B here. So we're just going to grab the B matrix. So it's a, it's a what? Zero, one over M, zero, 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 one over M. Okay. And then you can start filling all of this in here. So, uh, gosh, I don't know if I want to just sit here and spend five minutes like inputting all these zeros and ones, and I'm going to screw something up for sure. Uh, tell you what, okay, let, let's, let's just do it just so I don't mess, just for the, for completeness. Okay. So this third row is zero, zero, uh, zero, zero. And then it is a zero, zero, one over M zero. And then this column here is zero minus K one over M squared zero, zero. Then you got zero, zero, zero minus K two over M squared. You got minus K one over M squared, zero, 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 zero minus K two over M squared, zero. Okay. So here's what your PC matrix looks like now. And now if you go ahead and test the rank of this matrix, you either go ahead and do it in, again, in MATLAB or Mathematica here, you'll find out that the rank of PC is equal to four which is equal to the number of states. So now in this situation, this system is controllable, which again, if you look at the physical setup, that should make perfectly good sense. You got this mass here, but now we've got an, we've got two jets, right? We've got two engines, one thruster that can push it horizontally, one thruster that can push this thing vertically. So yeah, I'm, I'm almost positive that there should be no problem moving the state vector to any, in any location you want, right? So what this illustrated here was uh, kind of an interesting discussion in the sense that you can make your system controllable. What, one way to do this in many cases is just to, to add more actuators to your system, which again, hopefully makes good physical duh sense here. Here's just the math to back it up and to check that uh, that is indeed the case. Okay, let's go on to now example number four, which is kind of interesting. Let's call this a, uh, we're going to check if the system is controllable with a single input. So this was what we had in example three, right? We clearly saw that the system was controllable if you had two independent inputs, but tell you what, let's do this. Let's erase these two independent inputs. Let's say that I mount the thruster or the jet or the actuator almost like at a 45 degree angle. Something like this, like uh, here, here's my here's my horrible picture of a of a jet actuator, right? So so you fire this jet here and it shoots out flames out the back here or whatever, and it actuates this system uh, kind of on a diagonal. So what that means, if you think about this, another way we could model this is that there's a force F here on the horizontal direction, but there's the equal force F in the vertical direction. So these two are not independent anymore, right? When you fire this rocket, it actuates both horizontally and vertically with the same amount of force. Okay. So we should ask ourselves now, this is maybe not as intuitive. Can I move this block to any location I want using this single control input? So the way we can test that here is again, go ahead and do our controllability check. So we saw that the A matrix is not going to change, right? Because we didn't change any of the dynamics or the internal uh, makeup of the system, right? We only changed the external input or the controls. So your A matrix is going to be the exact same thing we had earlier, which was, uh, shoot, I, I erased it. Maybe I should write that down. Uh, darn it, darn it, darn it. Where'd I put? Oh, here, yeah, yeah. Okay, so 0, 1, 0, 0, minus K1 over M, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus K two over M zero. Okay. Now the only thing that changes is your B matrix. Okay. So if you went through the exact same procedure, what you'd end up with is that the B matrix in this case is going to be a zero one over M zero one over M. Okay. Because there's only one control input, which is this F. Okay. And now it enters in and controls both the horizontal and vertical dynamics in the same fashion, which is what you're seeing right there. Okay, so what we can do here is um, maybe it's a time it's it's time we start choosing some constants for this. So let's choose 
How about uh, a K1 of, I don't know, 1, a K2 of 4, maybe let, let's ma make a mass of 1, something like that. If you plug this in, what we can now do is run over to MATLAB and say, okay, the controllability matrix is CTRB of A and B, right? Because now we have numerical values of A and B. What this is basically doing B, A, B, A squared, B, a cubed B, right? It's just shorthand notation for that, okay? And then what we're going to go and do in MATLAB is check the rank of PC, okay? And if you do that, this is going to kick out four. We're go, we'll go check this in a second and just to, to, to double check that I'm not just making things up here. But what this tells us again is this system is completely controllable. So this is really interesting. If you start the block here at any location, like let's just say start it at zero, 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 right? Let's just say that your initial state is at the origin. The block is completely at rest at zero, zero, zero. And you want to move this thing to some arbitrary uh, location. Maybe let's, let, let, let's make something up. How about minus 2.27, minus 7.5, minus 2.41, 0 0.57, right? Again, if you remember, this is the, uh, the horizontal position, the horizontal velocity, the vertical position, and the vertical velocity. What this is telling us is that, yes, there does exist a control that will take you from this initial state to this, init to this final state. Uh, to, to prove I'm not pulling your chain here, again, let's run over to MATLAB and Simulink and just see that first let's check the system is controllable and then I'll show you uh, one such control that could actually arbitrarily move this system to uh, this location. All right, so here we are in MATLAB, and I've just uh, typed in our A and B matrices along with our constants so you don't have to watch me enter those in manually. Now, uh, this is actually the first time I guess we've tried to use the CTRB function, so let's just go ahead and hit the help on this, and we see that this basically just computes the controllability matrix for you. So what we want to do is just say PC is CTRB of A and B. Great, and then what we want to do is check the rank of that matrix. So let's go also and say help rank, and you see that, again, MATLAB provides a rank function that will help you determine the number of linearly independent rows or columns of a given matrix. So we just need to say rank of PC, and let's just go ahead and run this script. So here we go. Here's our PC matrix, and we see that it is indeed full rank, so the system should be controllable. So we should be able to get to that arbitrary uh, from the initial condition of all zeros to that arbitrary final condition using some type of control input. Just to prove that that's feasible here, let's just go ahead and take a look. I've got a Simulink model that I've already constructed, which is basically your A and B matrix with all of the states being output, and we're going to start at an initial condition of zero, and I've got a specific control input that actually will show that, yes, you can actually start from zero and get to that final condition. So if I just go ahead and run this model, you see that this input, uh, as soon as the scope comes up, this weird series of steps will actually get you a state trajectory as shown here. Whoops, actually, I guess what I should have done here is I should have switched the layout to have one by four. Let me, let me rerun this again just so it looks more reasonable. Sorry. There we go. So you get this state history, and the uh, final state is indeed the location that we are looking for. Now, I know something is probably going clang in the back of your head, and this is a little unsatisfying because I didn't tell you the, the, the controllability discussion doesn't actually tell us how to construct the controls that will get us there. It just says that, yes, a control does exist, and here's the proof of it. So we could move that that state to some weird uh, location using an input. All right, so that was pretty interesting. Let's move on to now example five here. And notice I left most of the example four uh, on the board because we're gonna make uh, use of this. We're gonna make a very small epsilon change here. So example five here now. And now I want to look at how the system is un controllable with a single input. So we just saw that it was controllable, but what actually happened here was the asymmetry of the problem allowed us to uh, independently control the horizontal and vertical dynamics. What would happen if we made K1 and K2 the same? So if we just had a K, if both of these were the same constant, everything, uh, it, we make some very minor changes to your A matrix, 
right? B matrix stays the same. Um, now these are both the same. Let's choose, uh, you know, a third. How about both these K's are a third. I guess you can call them K1, K2 if you if, if you want, right? You do everything back the same here, and what you're actually going to find out is actually this is going to drop down to two. So the rank will go from two to four. So this is no longer feasible. Well, I mean, maybe it might have been feasible, but you can't do an arbitrary initial condition to an arbitrary final condition. So the system becomes uncontrollable, and it's this symmetry that's that's causing the problem here. Um, we'll run back to MATLAB just to verify that I'm not just making this up. But again, I think you can see what's going on here. If the system is symmetrical here, and you have the symmetrical input sort of on both directions, there's no way, again, that you can independently move the states uh, to an arbitrary location. So uh, before we jump over to MATLAB, remember this scenario here where we have this symmetry problem causing uh, causing this uncontrollability, because we're going to revisit this in a couple of minutes. So in the meantime, let's jump over to MATLAB and quickly check that if you choose the same spring constants for both of them, you make the problem symmetrical, and then we have this loss in rank. Okay, so all I need to do is really, let's just copy all of this, and I'll paste it down below and make this an example five. And this is now showing that the system is uncontrollable with a single input. And what happens here is if we have the same spring constants in both directions, and we just, we're basically running the exact same code here. And yes, indeed, we see that in this case, the rank drops down to two. And uh, the system's uncontrollable. So this actually uh, sets the stage for the next part of the discussion where I want to talk about something called the, the PHB test. All right, so now I'd like to cover another topic that isn't as popular when talking about controllability, but I actually think that it's uh, almost more powerful. It seems to lend a little bit more information uh, when we're talking about trying to test for controllability of a system. And that topic here is known as the PBH test. Or this is named after um, a guy named Vasily Popov. And another person named Vitold Belovich. And finally, a guy named Melo Hatis. All very, very smart guys here. So uh, Popov has a book from uh, 1973. I think it's called Hyperstability uh, of Control Systems. Uh, Belovich has a uh, 1969 book or 68 book here called Classical Network Theory. And I actually wasn't able to exactly find when Hatus had uh, his contribution, but interestingly, he's the one that actually, if you look up the Hatus Lemma, I'll leave a link to it in the description below here. You'll actually be able to find this uh, a form of the PBH test here. Interestingly, I think he, this is fairly recent actually. You, you can find his website I found that was updated in 2004 here. So again, you can see this isn't, this isn't super old information. It's, it's somewhat relevant. So anyway, it's named after Popov, Belovich, and, and Hatis, or the PBH test here. Um, before we go any further, maybe what I also want to mention is a lot of the discussion that I'm going to talk about related to the uh, PBH test is uh, he heavily references and uses material from Steve Brunton. So if you haven't seen Professor Brunton's activity or actually his YouTube channel, Professor Brunton, he's, he's actually one of my colleagues at the University of Washington. So he's also a professor there, but he's in the mechanical engineering department. He does amazing work here. If you try to find uh, control systems videos on YouTube, I think you'll come up with two names. You'll come up with Brian Douglas, and then you'll come up with Steve Brunton. Those two seem to be the, the kings of control theory in, uh, in YouTube here. So I will leave a link to all of his material uh, and the relevant lecture that he does related to the uh, PBH test. I would just like to add to it maybe and maybe give it my spin as well. I don't know, maybe I need to give the rest of the discussion here with an overlay of, of his face over mine because like I said, a lot of this work uh, follows some of the material that, that he covered. So again, if you haven't had a chance to look at his channel, please subscribe to it, check it out, and watch the video here because I think it will help add to the discussion.
Okay, so that being said, let's talk about what exactly is the PBH uh, test. And I apologize, I, I know I'm gonna switch. I always wanna say PHB here, but it should be PBH. So if you hear me flipping those, those uh, letters in the future, this is what I'm talking about here, is this test. So what does this test state? So the test is actually really interesting. It basically says that the pair AB is controllable Right, this is what we're looking for. You have, a, you have an A matrix and a B matrix. This is controllable if and only if, I guess I'll write it as our, here's, here's your, our other way of two-way implication, right? If and only if that you have this funny test, rank of uh, A minus lambda I and then B for all lambda in the complex plane okay so this is what it states so you've got this matrix here inside the square brackets right you have this quantity here the first n columns is this thing it's a minus lambda i and then the last uh m columns is the matrix b so you kind of horizontally concatenate the two of these uh next to each other then you test the rank of the entire thing okay and it says that if this oh sorry <laughs> this has to equal n. The rank of this had better equal something, right? That you need n linearly independent rows or columns, I guess, in this sort of augmented concatenated matrix here. And you have to do this for any lambda here. So this lambda thing can be any complex number, okay? So this is uh, one of the original forms of the PBH test. Now, if you look at this thing here that I'm kind of going to highlight in, in green. This ought to look super, super familiar to you. This is the definition of an eigenvalue of A, right? Uh, where you have the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to zero. In other words, lambda, th this matrix is full rank all the time, except when lambda is an eigenvalue of A, because that's the whole definition of an eigenvalue, is the eigenvalue will make the determinant of this thing equal zero. Basically, it will make this matrix lose rank here. So, what we can see here is that, we should make a note here that A minus lambda I, its rank is full, unless lambda is an eigenvalue of A, right? So what that means here is, okay, you don't have to test lambda over the entire complex plane because you know for the vast majority of the complex plane, this is going to be full rank. So I don't even care about B. The only place you might have a problem is when lambda is equal to a, one of these eigenvalues. So an equivalent way to test for this is actually, you don't have to test the entire complex plane. You need to test lambda in the eigenvalues of A. Okay? So this is a lot easier because now instead of testing the entire complex plane, you have at most n eigenvalues to choose from here. So maybe what we'll do is let's add a little subscript i to the bottom of the lambda just to denote that, right? And you have to t test this for i equals one, two, three, up to n eigenvalues. So you know what? Let's box this up because this is actually important. We're going to keep using this and testing it. Right? So this is effectively the, the PBH test here. And in, in my notes, I'm gonna call this thing equation four, just to be consistent with my notes here. So if I keep referring to equation four, this is what I'm talking about, right? This is the controllability test, right? So instead of having to check the rank of the controllability matrix like we did earlier, what you could alternatively do is you could build this uh, concatenated matrix and then test its rank for the i different eigenvalues, or the n different eigenvalues, right? So you can see that it's uh, a little bit more cumbersome in the sense that you don't have to check the rank of one matrix. You actually have to check, you have to build this thing n different times and check its rank each time. But 
the, price, the, 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 the benefit of the additional complexity is this test, if we start digging into this, is going to give us a lot more information about what the structure of B needs to be in order to, to make the whole system controllable. So that's the beauty of the, the PBH test. It's, it's going to give us a lot more insight and a lot more information about the controllability or lack thereof uh, for the system. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and uh, give me a second to erase the board. Maybe I will move this this equation for up to a up to a corner where we can see it a little bit more and leave some more space for some examples and some specific case studies where we want to examine this a little further. Okay, so I've just moved the PBH test uh, up to the upper left corner of the board where we can continue to refer to it. And now what I want to do is let's dig into this a little bit more. So the first situation or the first case I want to look at is let's assume that this quantity A minus lambda I, let's assume that it is ranked efficient by one. So let's look at, uh, I'm going to call this maybe case one, that A minus lambda I I is ranked efficient by one. So in other words, I'm looking for the situation or I want to examine the situation where rank of just a minus lambda i times i is equal to n minus one. Okay, so uh, there are n minus one linearly independent rows. So all we've done here is lost rank by one. So if that's the case, right, we see that in order for the overall concatenated matrix to have rank of n, we see that b, all this matrix b needs to do is it needs to increase the rank by one, right? Because this quantity here, a minus lambda i, its rank is n minus one. So all b needs to do is bump up or augment by one. So in other words, what that means is b, this b just needs to be linearly independent of this a minus lambda i i. Right? So maybe we should write that down. So what we're basically saying here is uh, we need B to quote unquote increase rank, right? By one, okay? So what that actually means is you gotta just make sure that B is linearly independent of this uh, a minus lambda i i. Okay, so in this case, again, b, we're kind of considering b to just be a vector right now. Okay, so if this is a vector that needs to be linearly independent of all of these different vectors, you're basically saying it can't be in the range space of this, this matrix here, right? So the other way to maybe write this down is I could say that you just need B, it better not be, so it should not be an element of the range of A minus lambda I I, right? So if that's true, you're basically uh, uh, linearly independent, right? Because you're not within the span of all of these vectors that make up A minus lambda I I, right? It will be pointing in some other direction, okay? So this is great. Notice here that this is for a single eigenvector i, right? So this is uh, for a given lambda i, right? Now, the PHB test says you got to do this for all of the lambdas. So what we see here is that, okay, uh, you have one eigenvector. This will tell you b better not be in the eigenvector of, of uh, a minus, say, lambda 1i. But B also can't be in the range of A minus lambda 2i or A minus lambda 3i or A minus lambda ni, right? So overall, what we end up with here is if we have to make this uh, true for all eigenvalues, right? So to satisfy for all eigenvalues, we need B had better not be in, okay, you see it can't be in the range of a minus lambda 1i, right? But then it also can't be in the range of a minus lambda 2i, 
right? So maybe I better union these two sets together, right? Because this here is going to span a space, right? The range of this is some, some span in Rn, right? Um, this is another, maybe it's another plane or something like that. Uh, we're going to take a look at this. I, you know me, I love physical examples and I, have a, I like to talk about things in concrete ideas here. So let's write it down first and then we'll go look at it, right? So you can't be in this space, you can't be in this space, and you know what? This pattern repeats all the way to range of a minus lambda ni, right? So there are these n spaces that b can't be in, because if b is in any of them, it will be, it will fail this test for one of these eigenvalues, right? So let's box this up. This is what we want to look at, okay? And now the question is, what the heck is this space here, a minus lambda 1i? What is the space a minus lambda 2i? And finally, what does the union of all of these spaces look like? Because that will tell you where b had better not be in if you want to stay controllable. So again, let's look at, talk about a concrete example here. So let's look at here, I'm going to call this example 6. Okay, let's look at illustrating the PBH test. Okay, so in this case, here's the A matrix I want to look at. It's a three by three. Okay, so you got one, two, three, two, one, zero, zero, two, four. Okay, so here's your three by three matrix. If you go run over to MATLAB and you get the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors for this system, uh, you would just do something like Eig A, ask it for the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Let's call them V and D. Okay, so what you would end up with here is, let me just go ahead and write it down. You'd get eigenvalues uh, like such. So you'd get a lambda 1 of 0, and this has an associated eigenvector, let's call it V1 here, of uh, what does this look like? It is, uh, well, actually, let me get a little more space because I'm going to write it. V1. Okay, it's going to be uh, 0 0.408 minus 0 0.817, 0 0.408. Transpose. Crud. Is that going to shoot? Did I run off the page here? Uh, so, okay, sorry. Tell you what, let, let me scoot this all over. L let me move this all down here. I don't want to run out of space. All right, I'm going to rewrite this here. Okay, so lambda 1 is 0, and then its associated eigenvector v1 is 0 0.408 minus 0.817 and 0 0.408. Okay, and then transpose, right? I want the eigenvector to be a vertical vector. Okay, and then the second eigenvalue, lambda 2, is going to be uh, 1, and its associated eigenvector is 0. And then uh, 0 0.832, and then minus 0 0.555. And again, transpose that sucker. And then finally, lambda 3 is going to be 5. And then V3 is going to be 0 0.667, 0 0.333, and then 0 0.667 transposed. Okay, so. Here's the, uh, the eigenvalues, the associated eigenvectors. So now what we want to do is I want to compute some of these spaces, like a minus lambda 1 times the identity matrix. Okay, <clears throat> and then uh, I think to do that, let's go over to MATLAB actually to do these calculations. So what I'm going to do in MATLAB is a couple of things. So what we want to visualize first is I want to get an idea of what the heck is this range of a minus lambda 1i. So if you remember, um, the range of a minus lambda 1i. So this is going to be pretty simple in this case, right? Because uh, lambda 1 is just 0. So this really turns out to be what is the range of a, right? So we're basically asking, what are the linearly independent uh, columns of this matrix A here? So this is basically saying, um, I need to form a, 
a basis for the span of all of these columns here. So luckily MATLAB has a command called orth, which will uh, allow us to do that. So tell you what, why don't we go over, do this in MATLAB, we'll go ahead and effectively compute what is the span of all these three columns here, okay? And uh, we'll plot some of these um, some of these spaces here, like what does that space span, and also where can be the, the, the matrix B, where can that be <laughs> within this space, okay? So let's jump over to MATLAB and try to visualize a couple of these spaces. All right, so here we are in MATLAB. I've just gone ahead and typed in the A matrix that we're interested in. So the next thing that we want to do here is get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of A. So we're just going to go VD and call the eig function in MATLAB. And if we run this, we see that we get the eigenvectors. MATLAB is helpful and returns those eigenvectors in column format. So this first column is the first eigenvector, which corresponds to this first eigenvalue. The second column is the second eigenvector corresponding to this second eigenvalue. And finally, the third uh, column is the third eigenvector corresponding to this third eigenvalue. So what we can do is we can go ahead and extract the eigenvalues lambda 1, 2, 3 by just pulling off the diagonal entries, and then we'll pull off the columns 1, 2, 3 to get the eigenvectors. Uh, now, we can also check slash verify the eigenvalue slash eigenvector pairs. So in other words, we know that a minus lambda 1 times identity matrix of 3, so this is a minus lambda uh, lambda 1i. The whole idea with the eigenvector v1, right, that corresponds to this eigenvalue uh, lambda 1, is that this eigenvector actually lives in the null space, or it exists in the null space of this highlighted matrix, right? So this entry, when, I, when we execute it, it better come out to be 0, or as close to 0 as numerical round off is going to allow. And let's do the same thing for for two and three as well okay so again let's run this and we see yes zero 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 so good we got the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors correctly let's go ahead and suppress the output of some of these things we don't care about any longer now what we want to do is let's get into some of the stuff that's relevant to the um, PBH test so we said the next thing we need to do is I need to compute the range of a minus lambda I times i, right? Because we said the whole idea with the PBH test showed that the B matrix cannot be in this range. It needs to be linearly independent of this range. So the first thing I need to understand here is let's get what is the range of this matrix. So for example, let's first compute this for how about a minus lambda 1 times i3. So here's a minus lambda 1i. So if we run this, here's what this thing looks like. Okay, and what we're going to see here is that the rank of that is actually only two because the whole idea is the eigenvalue is going to make this matrix rank deficient, and in this case, it's going to make it rank deficient by one. So, for example, if I type in rank of answer, we see that yes, it's only two. So, there are only two linearly independent columns in this um, matrix. So the basis for that space, or the, that would, uh, the two vectors that would span this, I can make two vectors which would span this space. So like we said earlier, MATLAB has this great command called orth. Um, here you go, it's an orthonormal basis for the range of A. That's exactly what I want to do. So let's just wrap this with an orth command. And what this is going to do, if I run this, is now, here we go, these are the linearly independent uh, columns, or a basis for the linearly independent columns of the range of this matrix, okay? So, let me just, I'll assign this to a variable, so I don't know, range A minus lamb, oops, lambda 1, I, it's this. I know that's not the, the prettiest thing in the world here, but I think it gets the idea across. Maybe let's copy this and do it for 2 and 3 as well. So A minus lambda 2 and 3, and then I just need to change lambda 2 and 3. So again, all of these should just be two vectors. So here we go. So here's here's uh, the, the range of A minus lambda 1i is spanned by these two vectors, and then here it is for the other a minus lambda 2i. It's spanned by these two vectors, and then finally these other vectors. So the good thing is since we are doing this in three dimensions, I can plot these vectors, right? These are just, yeah, they're just vectors, right? There's nothing fancy about them. So 
to do that, tell you what, I actually prepared it somewhere off screen. Let's look at just the first one. A minus lambda 1i. Let's just plot these two vectors. So this column and this column and plot the space that it spans. So that's what I've got over here. So let me see if I can maybe, I'll make this a little bigger. We can kind of keep the two of them next to each other just so we can get a rough idea. So these dark red lines are these two columns, right? And then the shaded patch, I'm trying to visualize the space spanned by these two vectors. And as you can see, all that is, it's every linear combination of those two vectors here, right? So it just makes this plane in three space, right? Okay, so that's one easy way that we can visualize the space of uh, what is the range of A minus lambda 1i, right? This is what it looks like. It's this red transparent plane in space, okay? Now, I don't want to clutter this up too much, so these dark red arrows, I'm just not going to plot these individual vectors, but I'm going to leave the space that they span as a sort of uh, semi-transparent color. So I tell you what, let me sh let me show you that figure over here. I want to plot them without the arrows. So here you go. This is what it looks like. Right? Again, it's that exact same uh plane except I just haven't plotted this vector and this vector. Whoops, excuse me. Okay? So again, the red one, let's make that range of a minus lambda 1i, okay? Now, I'll add on top of this a green plane. This is a minus lambda 2i, and we see that it's a different plane, right? The range of a minus lambda 2i spans a different space in, in effectively R2, right? It's a two-dimensional surface, which is embedded in R3, right? Okay, and finally, let's go ahead and add the third one, a minus lambda 3. So that's this blue one. So we got a red, green, and a blue spaces, and these are these quantities a minus lambda 1i, a minus lambda 2i, and a minus lambda 3i, right? These are the spaces spanned by it. Okay, so what we saw with the PBH test is that if your B matrix is in any of these ranges, so we saw that what each one of these things were, where they, they sort of represented, uh, they could be drawn as a 2D plane in our, in our example. Right? If B is in any one of those planes, you're a little bit hosed, right? In the sense that your system's uncontrollable. So, for example, we could go ahead and construct ourselves a B uncontrollable, just for illustrative purposes, um, by basically let's let's just maybe make it live in the range of this. In in this this was the red plane, right? That we just drew up in MATLAB. So you could do something like uh, to use MATLAB speak, we could say range of a minus lambda one i. Right. We saw that this was basically a space spanned by two vectors. Um, let's just do this. How about all rows column one? I'm trying to to uh, use sort of MATLAB speak. And I guess in MATLAB, remember, instead of using the range command, I think what we're using is the orth command. Right. To generate an orthonormal basis for this space here. So let's take the first basis vector and we will add it to the second basis vector. Right, which is all rows column two. And then you can add on some linear constants to the front of this. It really doesn't matter. I don't know. How about minus 0 0.8? And then how about plus 1.2? Right? So all we're doing here is we're making a linear combination of uh, two basis vectors, which yields another vector which is still in the range of this of this original matrix, right? So if you work out the numbers for this using our MATLAB example, I think you come up with something like, uh, what is this? Minus 0 0.267, uh, 0 0.989, minus 1.016, okay? So we claim that this is, is uncontrollable because this vector, it's still going to be in this red plane, right? And we'll go back to MATLAB and check that in a second, right? It's still going to be lying in the red plane somewhere, so it's uncontrollable. Now, for example, we could contrast that with a controllable system, right? So a controllable one would be basically anything that's not in that space. So let's just make something up and then we will go verify that it doesn't lie in one of in the red, green or blue plane. So how about 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 or sorry, 0 0.25 and negative quarter uh, and then one, right? 
So we should be able to see that these two are uncontrollable and controllable, right? And we can actually check that using our earlier controllability matrix check right now. Since we've got the A matrix, we've got the B matrix, we could go ahead and make the controllability matrix and check its rank. But let's do both. Let's go back and show that this vector B lives in the red plane and that this vector B does not live in either the red, green, or blue plane. All right, so let's go ahead and make our B uncontrollable. And we said that we were just going to use this matrix, right? All rows, column one, plus all rows, column two. And we're going to add some random constants in front of it. I think we said minus 0 0.8. Uh, and then maybe let me move this to the next row, uh, 1.2, right? Something like that. So this was our uncontrollable matrix. And um, tell you what, l l let's do this first, okay? So if you go ahead and execute to here, we see, yep, here's that matrix that we were, or sorry, the vector that we were talking about, right? And now what we can do is let's plot that on top of here was our, our diagram, right, with all of these these spaces. So what we should see is this B uncontrollable vector. It basically lives in this red plane. So if I go ahead and uh, add that here, let me go ahead and try to do that as sort of this there this purple line. Okay, so this purple line right here, this is B uncontrollable. And as you can clearly see, it is smack dab in the red plane, right? So it is in, it's an element of the range of A minus lambda 1i, okay? So we should see that this is basically uh, uncontrollable. So if we want to verify that, what we can just do is just say CTRB of A and then B uncontrollable, right? And then we should check its rank. And we should see that this is 2, and it indeed it is. So it is uncontrollable. So that verified our uh, PBH test. Now, how about B controllable? All right, let's do something else. Uh, I think we had 0 0.1 minus 0 0.25 and 1. This was our controllable uh, vector. Okay, so again, if I add this now to the plot, let's go ahead and bring up my plot. Okay, so here's all the spaces we're interested in. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot uh, B controllable now. And I add this as this orange-ish vector. And there you go. So you can see here that the orange vector, it doesn't live in any of the planes, right? It's not a member of any of those sets. So what we think, uh, what the PHB test is going to tell us is that, or sorry, the PBH, see, I told you I was going to switch that here. The PBH test should say that this orange vector is controllable, okay? So let's go ahead and confirm that now, that all we need to do is basically do this exact same check, except now put in B controllable, and now if we run, there we go. It is now full rank. Okay. Now, while we're here, I think this is an interesting corollary that we should discuss here. If you watch Steve Brunton's video, he talks about how um, a random B vector is very likely controllable. It's If you choose some vector B out of the state space in random, it's very likely that the system will be controllable. And I think this is a great time to, 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 to talk about that. If we're looking at all of these spaces here and all of these planes, we see that the only time you are uncontrollable is if your vector is in either the red green or blue plane so it's really difficult it's like if you pick a random vector out of this r3 space you've got to land on one of these sheets of paper so you'd have to be very very unlucky to land in a red green or blue plane it's very likely that if you just pick something randomly it's going to be like this orange vector in the sense that it points somewhere else completely independent and therefore it is going to be controllable uh according to the php test so what's actually interesting is we can expand on this concept here if we recall the good old friend the rank nullity theorem uh, okay, so if you remember, the idea with the rank nullity theorem here is it stated that basically the 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 range space or the column space uh, or the rank effectively of the matrix is sort of 
well, I guess we should say this more precisely, right? The, the range space and the null space of the matrix are sort of complementary in the sense that the rank of a given matrix, let's call it Z, plus the nullity or the dimension of the null space of Z, this makes up the full space, okay? So again, if your matrix Z is rank deficient, that means it has some null space, and that null space is linearly independent of the range space here, right? That's what basically what the rank nullity theorem is saying. Now, in our case, the matrix Z that we're interested in is we're focusing on the rank of this thing, A minus lambda I I, right? So if I apply the rank nullity theorem to the matrix that we're interested in, right, plus nullity, of a minus lambda i i, this has got to equal n, okay? So we said that for an eigenvalue, we know that the rank of this is, is deficient by at least one. And I think in this case, we're looking at it to be, to be just one to now. We're gonna extend this to more than two, okay? So this rank is n minus one, right? So that means the null space has to have at least, well, I guess in this case, it has to have dimension of one here, right? Now, we should ask ourselves, what is the null space of this matrix A minus lambda I I, right? So basically, what is null space of A minus lambda I I? Again, if you remember the definition of null space, it's basically what are any vectors that when you multiply it, this matrix by, you get a big fat zero, right? Again, this should be screaming out. And in fact, we actually just did this calculation in MATLAB when we were checking the eigenvectors, right? This is by definition the eigenvector of A that corresponds to lambda I, right? So this is like, we should maybe call it VI, right? It's the eigenvector that goes with this eigenvalue, right? So what we see here, what's so interesting about this is that it's saying here that the eigenvector, right? The other way we could think about this is that the eigenvector of A has to be linearly independent of the range of A minus lambda I I. Okay, so, so maybe we should write that down. Uh, what do I want to erase? What do I want to erase? Let's, let's, let's get rid of our, our matrix here. We don't need this here, but maybe we'll keep these eigenvectors and eigenvalues up uh, for a second. So what this basically is telling us is that the eigenvector VI, right, this cannot be in the range of A minus lambda II, right? Because it's basically saying it's got to be complementary, right? It's got to be in another dimension. It has to be linearly independent so that its dimension will augment whatever the this is deficient by, right? So that is fascinating. So it's basically telling us that the eigenvector is going to point in a different direction. So what we can write down is, let's, let's do this for each one of these. So, so V1, this can't be in the range of A minus lambda 1i, right? Which is great because if you look at this, that's exactly this, this, this term right here, right? So V1, is not gonna be, it's gonna, it's, this was the red plane, I guess, if you wanna think about it, right? V1 is not gonna be in the red plane. It's gonna guaranteed to be pointing in some other direction. And similarly, for V2 and V3. So V2 is not gonna be in the range of A minus lambda 2i, and V3 is not gonna be in the range of A minus lambda 3i, okay? Now, before we get too excited, though, you should note here, right? We said that, okay, your B matrix, it can't be in the range of this unioned with the other ranges. What's a little bit insidious about this is if you look at this, this eigenvector V1, yeah, it definitely is not going to be in the red plane. V2 is not going to be in the green plane. And V3 is not going to be in the blue plane. But <laughs> what's kind of fascinating is V1 is in the range of A minus lambda 2i and range of A minus lambda 3i. So it's not going to be in the red plane, but it's actually going to be in the green and the blue plane. And similarly for V2. So V2 is going to be in the range of A minus lambda 1i 
and the range of a minus lambda 3i. And finally, v3 is going to be in the range of a minus lambda 1i, uh, sorry, 1i, and range of a minus lambda 2i. Right? So this is a little odd. Basically, you don't want to pick v1 by itself. Because if you picked V1 by itself, yeah, you would satisfy the fact that it's not in the red plane, but it would intersect in the green and the blue plane, and you'd end up with a uncontrollable system. Similarly with V2 by itself and V3 by itself. By themselves, they individually satisfy one of these conditions, but not all three simultaneously. Okay. Now, here's the other interesting kicker then. However, uh, we ran out of space here. Maybe I'll just write it. Yeah, I, I hate to do this, but whatever. V1 plus V2 plus V3 is controllable in this case. Right? So if you linearly add all of these together, you'll actually end up with um, uh, a, a controllable system. Now, I, I don't know if I can say this is, this is true for, for all situations. If you watch uh, Steve Brenton's video, he does talk about how you need to have a B matrix which has components in every single one of the eigenvectors here. And uh, we see the inklings of that here. But what I think would be helpful though is let's go to MATLAB and let's actually look and, and show you that this V1 doesn't lie in the red plane, but it lies in the other two planes. Similarly, V2 doesn't lie in the green plane, but it lies in the other two planes, etc., etc. So I just think this is a fascinating discussion here and shows the uh, shows how, how the eigenvectors work their way in here while we're also talking about eigenvalues. Again, these things always seem to come in pairs. They go hand in hand, right? So let's jump over to MATLAB and visualize what does V1, V2, and V3 actually look like. All right, so here we are in MATLAB, and just for giggles, let's go ahead and just check the uh, rank nullity theorem for this case. So we basically said that uh, rank nullity theorem said that a minus lambda 1 times i, we said this was basically the... Um, uh, the, the range of the matrix that we're interested in, right? This, but when we augmented with the eigenvector, right? This thing should have full rank, right? And similarly, we should be the same for uh, eigenvector eigenvalue 2 and eigenvector eigenvalue 3, right? So all of these, uh, yes, this is going to be ranked efficient by 1, but V1 uh, should be in another direction. So again, all these, uh, oh, whoops, sorry. Yeah, it's not I, it's I. <laughs> Let me try that again. Okay, let's try this. And yes, here we go. 3, 3, 3. So yes, the rank nullity theorem seemed to check out. So now what we should do is let's go ahead and get our picture here and uh, go ahead and plot all of those eigenvectors. So remember, here's eigenvector V1, V2, and V3. These are these vectors that we know V1, we claim, is going to not be in the red plane. Uh, by definition, V2 is not going to be in the green plane, and V3 is not going to be in the blue plane. And finally, let's let's maybe make a uh, composite vector, which is just the sum of those two, uh, all these. So let's call it, I don't know, some vector V1, V2, V3 is V1 plus V2 plus V3. Okay, so maybe let's run this. Okay, all right, so here are the vectors we're interested in. Okay, so let's just go ahead and I'll grab my little figure that we had, we had plotted earlier, right? This was visualizing all of these spaces that you want to effectively avoid if you want to stay controllable. And now let's go ahead and first add uh, V1. So if I plot V1, it's, the, it's, it's this red dot uh, line, this thick red line that just appeared. And you can clearly see that, yes, V1 does not lie in the red plane, right? It's pointing in a different direction. But as you see, <laughs> it actually lies in both the green and blue plane simultaneously. So uh, this should be uncontrollable. Right, and similarly, let's go ahead and add maybe the uh, the v2 vector. Right, so you should see another vector appear right now. There, the, here's the green one. So again, we see that yes, the v2 does not lie in the green plane, but if you circle this around enough, you see that well, look at this. It lies in the red and the blue plane. So again, still uncontrollable. 
Finally, let's add V3, eigenvector V3. There it is, as the blue vector. I just plotted it. And again, it doesn't lie in the blue plane, but guess what? It lies in the other two planes, so it is uncontrollable. So if we want to check that, right, let's go ahead and verify that eigenvectors by themselves are not controllable. Right, so what I need to do is CTRB of A and V1 here, right? And I need to check the rank of that thing. And then we need to do this for the other two as well. Okay, so look at that, 2, 2, 1, yikes. So definitely not controllable. However, let's check if V1 plus V2 plus V3 is controllable. So again, I'm just going to do rank of V1, V2, V3, right? This was this mega vector that we created, which was a combination of all three eigenvectors. And now in that case, we get a controllable system. And in fact, I think what we can do is let's just go ahead and, 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 and draw it on our nice composite diagram, maybe as, a, as, an, as an orange. So let me go ahead and right now you should see a vector show up now. There it is. There's the orange. And here's that V1, V2, V3. And you see, when we add all three of those eigenvectors together, we get a third vector, which is clear of all of the planes here. And we end up with a controllable system. All right, so now I think we're getting a pretty good feel for the PBH test for the situations where B is a vector, right? Where this basically lost rank of one, okay? And we saw that if B is a vector, yeah, it makes sense to be talking about when is a vector in the range of another matrix, things like that. But what about, uh, let's look at another case. This is case two, right? Uh, what happens if A minus lambda I I is rank deficient by more than one, right? Case one, what we were talking about earlier is when A minus lambda I, I was rank deficient by just one. And we saw that in that case, yeah, we have B that is a, that is a matrix, uh, a vector here. But now let's go ahead and consider what happens if this A minus lambda I is rank deficient by, by more than one. So in other words, what we have to do is let's choose an index that is the eigenvalue which makes this lose the most rank here. So what I want to say here is choose slash consider the eigenvalue P that makes A minus lambda PI lose the most rank. And what I mean by that is when you go A minus lambda P I and you look at the rank of this thing, right, that you lose more than uh, one linear independent column. You lose maybe a lot. So let, let's say that this rank comes out to be M, okay? So in this case, we see that uh, if M, and M here is usually M is going to be, well, I'll tell you what, let, let, let's, let's, let's work this out a little bit further. Okay, so now if the rank of this is M, right, so this entire side is M, we see that B, in order for it to be controllable, you need to bring it up to N. So what B needs to be is B needs to be at least N minus M, right? It needs to be have that many linearly independent uh, columns, right? So what we can do here is let's write this down. So if we compare this with, I guess what we call the equation four, so comparing with equation four, we see that B needs to, let's say quote unquote, make up at least n minus m uh, rank, right? In other words, what this means is that the uh, the number of linearly independent r columns of B has to be n minus m at least. So what that means is, if you think about this long enough, that your B it can't be a, a, a single vector any longer, right? Because if this was just a single vector, the most number of linearly independent rows or columns that this adds from this is the situation we were just looking at. You could hope that it is not lying in any one of those planes. And what that will do is that will add a dimension of at least one. But if you need N minus M at least, B now has to be a matrix, right? So now this thing has to be a matrix where you have at least 
n minus m columns, right? And furthermore, I say at least because if you had n minus m columns, each one of these need to be linearly independent from a minus lambda pi, okay? You could have more, right? That would give you more chances to become linearly independent of this and bring the overall rank of the system up to n. But at a minimum, you need n minus m columns, okay? So maybe we should write this down. Uh, what we see now is that we have kind of two conditions. So condition one here is we see that the dimension of B has got to be at least greater than or equal to N minus M. Okay, so that's a, our discussion we just had, right? Uh, and now we also see that in order to do this part where we said, quote unquote, making up the rank, right? It mathematically means that the columns of B have to be or at least n minus m columns of b have to be linearly independent of a minus lambda pi, right? So we can say that uh, the way we could write that is we could say that the range of b, right, is linearly independent uh, from range of a minus lambda pi right so this need I, I don't i don't necessarily want to cross this out because the, the the idea is correct because what we're talking about here is this is for one eigenvalue lambda p there could be multiple eigenvalues again so you're gonna have to do this for all of the different eigenvalues so you're gonna have to repeat this check for every single eigenvalue and the reason why i'm kind of hesitant about this i don't know if this is the right notation any longer because b it's it's not a vector any longer right it's a matrix so the concept we were trying to encapsulate up here is again that b was linearly independent from from range of a minus lambda i i so now I don't know if we should write is not a member. Maybe to uh, maybe to, to 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 modify this appropriately, we should say that B uh, is Li from range of a minus. Right. So uh, yeah, yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. And I guess it's not really B here, uh, it's really the range of B. So maybe again, we need to sort of modify this operation to be, right? It's the orthonormal basis which, or, or any basis that B makes up, right? Because B, again, it could be huge. You could have 500 control inputs, been, and really you just need uh, N minus M of them to be linearly independent from the rest in order to, to be controllable, right? So the natural question then, I think the extension of this question is when would you have a situation where you could, uh, where you, you take off an eigenvalue and lose more than one rank here, right? So let me, let's, let's, let's ask the question is when does a minus lambda i i uh, have deficiency, have rank deficiency of more than one, have right? So again, we can we can answer that question if we go back to the uh, to the uh, rank nullity theorem, right? Where we said earlier that okay, the rank of a minus lambda i i plus the nullity of a minus lambda i i is equal to the the total dimension of the space here right so what i'm looking for here is this is going to be uh n minus uh let me see like it's it's gonna be greater than two so yeah i guess we can call it n minus m here right so that means that the only time that this is going to lose more than one, so the only time m is greater than one, is when the null space is greater than one. So this is going to be a dimension m, right? 
So when the equivalent question is, when does the null space have more than one dimension? Well, that must mean that you actually have a multiplicity of eigenvalues, right? Because if you have a multiplicity of eigenvalues, then your null space or your eigenvector space, you'll have two eigenvectors for the same eigenvalue, so they're going to span a different location, right? Or, or, or a larger space. So the answer to this question here, and maybe we should write this down here, is when you have repeated eigenvalues, right? So this is actually fascinating, and this is where we, you know, maybe if you tuned out with all the math and this wasn't wasn't quite your bag, now's the time to tune back in because we're going to relate all of this to the physical system. So if we follow this logic and we say, all right, if you have multiple Eigen, if you have repeated eigenvalues in your A matrix, what that means is that means that your null space is going to be large, more than one dimension. Therefore, in order to be controllable, your B matrix is going to have to have more than one vector, right? It's going to have to have a dimension at least this big, right? What does that physically mean? What is the what is the physical representation of your B matrix? The B matrix is the it, it, the number of columns of the B matrix tell you the number of independent controls you have in your system. So this is really cool. We can write this down. I really where should we where should we write this down? Let, let's ah oh gosh I want to I want to keep a lot of this stuff up. Tell you what let's let's erase this. So what we end up with here is if you have Let me see. Uh, um, maybe if there is a multiplicity, let's call it this, right? If there is a multiplicity of eigenvalues uh, in your matrix A with degree M, right? You have M repeated eigenvalues. Uh, then the system requires at least, maybe we'll underline that, M indiv individual, maybe you can call them independent, or, or separate, however you want to think about them controls uh, to be controllable, right? That's the takeaway from this whole discussion, right? Because again, if there's a multiplicity of eigenvalues of degree m, that means this uh, a minus lambda pi is going to be ranked efficient by, at le by, by m right for that given eigenvalue therefore in order to be controllable this is ranked efficient by m this b has to bring up or make up at least m uh, m rank right so in order to do that this has to have at least m columns at least right it could always have more so the minimum that you could get away with here is you need at least m individual controls so this is fascinating because it's basically telling you if you want say this is your airplane right this is an aircraft or some some complicated system right and you look at the a matrix and it's got multiple multiplicity of say degree two you know that there's no way you will ever get a single control to make this system controllable. You need at least two actuators to this system. So that I think is, is fascinating and I think that is a super helpful result of this. Not only do you know now the dimension of the controls, right, but you also know where does this B matrix need to live? What does it need to look like? What does the structure need to be? You see that it has to be linearly independent from all of these. It, it almost gives you a way to see what are admissible and inadmissible B matrices. So you as a control engineer or as a, just a general engineer um, can try to now design your B matrix to satisfy these conditions to guarantee controllability. So again, I think this was a little bit abstract. Maybe what we should do is again, let's go ahead and jump over to MATLAB and revisit that example where we had the two springs um, 
jumping, uh, moving around. And actually, before we go to MATLAB, maybe what we should do is we should look at the board and revisit the actual diagram just to refresh everyone's memory. But again, I can't stress it enough. Maybe before we, we do that, let's say it again. This, this uh, PBH test is very, very helpful and very useful because not only does it allow you to test controllability, but it gives us a lot of insight and intuition into the B matrix and more importantly, what the B matrix can and can't look like if you want to be controllable or not. So again, I think it's really neat. And finally, again, another plug, you should really watch Steve Brunton's video on this. He also gives additional discussion on this and gives another alternative way to think about it. And I think maybe with two views, uh, maybe this makes, will start to make a little bit of sense. But you know me, again, I like concrete examples. Let's go revisit example number five uh, and apply this concept of multiplicity and the P PBH test uh, for multiple, a system that needs multiple control inputs now in order to be controllable. All right, so with that in mind, I'd like to revisit example five. So let's call this example seven, which is revisit example five. And again, here's the picture that went with example five. This was a system where we had the symmetrical system, right? It was a mass with two equal springs here, and uh, we were trying to actuate it uh, um, in the same fashion in the horizontal and vertical direction, and we saw that this system was uncontrollable. So in this case, we saw that uh, if we chose, again, I think we used a K1, it was equal to K2 was a third, and a mass was equal to one. So if you do that, your A and your B matrix end up being, uh, let's see, the A matrix comes out to, I think we actually did this earlier, but just for completeness, let's rewrite it here. Zero, zero, minus one third, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 oh, sorry, no, this is minus one third, minus one third, and a zero, right? And your B matrix comes out to, zero one zero one okay so uh from our discussion from the php test we see that really what we care about here is the eigenvalues of a so if we went ahead and computed the eigenvalues of a what you would end up finding here is you'd find out that lambda one is uh, 0 0.866 lambda two is minus 0 0.5i lambda three is 0 0.866 and then a lambda four is minus 0.5i. So actually it looks like there's a multiplicity of two here and there's also another multiplicity of two. Okay? So if we go ahead and we try to apply our, our PHB test or basically what we were calling equation four, for example, let's choose uh, lambda one here. So let's apply equation four for lambda one. Okay, so again, that said that we needed A, B is controllable, uh, right, if and only if we needed rank of the combination A minus lambda 1 I and then B to be equal to N. Okay, so we know that since there is a multiplicity of two with this first eigenvalue here, the um, eigenvector space or the null space of this has dimension two. So we know that rank of a minus lambda one i, this is equal to just two, okay? So we see that B, in order to make up the dimensionality or the amount of rank that we lost here, or, the, or how much this is rank deficient, we see that B, it has to be two things that we saw earlier. B, it has to not be in the range uh, of A minus lambda I, and it also has to have dimensionality two. In fact, the other way what we said is we see that B needs uh, to be linearly independent, right, of a minus lambda 1i and have dimensionality 2, right? So what this is basically telling us is that b, it, it can't be just a vector anymore. b has got to look like two columns here, right? 
And these two columns have to be linearly independent of a minus lambda i1 in order to just meet it for just lambda 1. We're going to have to do the same test for lambda 2, uh, 2 slash 4 as well. But what this shows us is at a minimum, you see b has to be two columns. What this physically means here is you need two independent inputs to the system. So we're not going to be able to cut it with one input here. The PHP test is telling us you, you're never going to be able to get away with it. You have to have at least two inputs, which is basically telling us you can't mount this single rocket on this symmetrical system and hope to be able to change it, right? You need these two things to have an F horizontal and an F vertical here, right? These have to be able to be actuated independently of each other. So you actually need to mount a rocket in one direction and then another one in the other direction. And I guess they don't even have to be exactly lined up in this fashion, right? As long as they're not linearly independent, right? As long as where, whichever direction you, you choose to mount them, it yields a B matrix, which is uh, not in the range of a minus lambda one i, you'll be able to satisfy it for, for this, this eigenvalue pair. Then you're gonna have to, again, repeat it here for the second pair to also make sure you're, you're, you're not in that range space either. So again, the PHB test we see here is, is really, really actually helpful because it's showing us the required structure that B has to have in order for the system to be controllable. And in this case, this is actually an even more helpful uh, result because we see that the second you know the eigenvalues of A, what you should do then is look, are there any multiplicities here? If there's, there are multiplicities of the eigenvalues of A, that is gonna tell you, you're not gonna be able to get away with just one control. And the, the degree of the multiplicity is gonna tell you the number of independent controls that you actually need for the system to be controllable. So again, this is really, really awesome because you have this somewhat quasi abstract mathematical theorem, but we're able to remap this into physical requirements on the system and how that impacts your, your potential engineering and control design. So uh, again, with that, I think that is a good spot to, to leave the PHB test. Again, check out Steve Brunton's video uh, talking about controllability and the PHB test. Uh, he does a really good job discussing this and it's well worth your time. All right, everyone, so I think this is a good spot to leave it. This was a pretty good discussion here on controllability, both using the controllability matrix, which we saw was a convenient and easy way to check controllability of a linear system, as well as the PBH test, which was a slightly more cumbersome way to check controllability, but it gave us an incredible amount of knowledge and understanding about the structure of the B matrix and how it's related to controllable and uncontrollable systems. So if you like the video, please do uh, subscribe to the channel because it will help me continue making these as well as it will allow you to uh, be notified of future discussions. Particularly, we're going to have a future discussion applying this controllability concept to full state feedback and linear quadratic regulators. So that's coming on down the pike. So I would recommend you stick around for that. Um, also, you'll notice I've got a large, uh, I'm trying to build up a library of these control systems discussions and other engineering topics as well, like MATLAB and Mathematica. If you'd like to see a more comprehensive syllabus and discussion of all of these videos in a proper, concise uh, order that makes sense to maybe study as part of a undergraduate or graduate controls course, please check out the description. I've got a link to a syllabus and larger curriculum then. So uh, with that being said, I think it's a good spot to leave it. Uh, if you've been a longtime subscriber, thank you very much. And if you're new to the channel, I hope to see you at a future video. Uh, until next time, I'll talk to you later. Bye.